Great. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, I am going to start this evening with a bit of a uh, disclaimer, uh, confession. Um, I am not a historian by any stretch of the imagination, and I feel a little bit challenged uh, just by this audience knowing where you focus so much of your uh, time and attention. Um, with all of that said, I um, have the great fortune of having been associated with some people, and some of you in this room may have even seen a presentation that my retired colleague, Battalion Chief Ralph Darn, did a number of years ago in which he essentially did pretty much catalog uh, the, the best of the history as we know it um, back then. Um, and from that, you know, I've been able to you know, garner so much information, um, you know, the beginning of the first fire company in 1898, uh, you know, the acquisition of apparatus over the years, the building of a number of companies in areas of the county that, quite frankly, you know, are not even recognizable, you know, to the non-historian uh, today. Um, we, uh, having started in, in 1898, um, were pretty much back then uh, like the American Fire Service uh, in actually pre-colonial or colonial times, um, being volunteers, you know, men of the community who decided that protection needed to be afforded to the residents, to the businesses, um, and began to organize themselves and react to emergencies um, to do the best that they could in protection of their fellow citizens and their communities. Um, over the years, you know, the volunteer service has endured. In fact, today, 70% of the American fire service is still volunteer. 80% of the American public is served by a career fire department, however. And that is simply um, uh, due to the fact that we have big concentrations of people in cities, on the coasts, and that's where, you know, a good deal of the career fire departments have developed. Nonetheless, we have huge swaths of this country that are still primarily served, you know, by citizen volunteers, people who organize themselves in the same way that they did as, me as many as 300 years ago uh, in order to, you know, to, to serve their communities. So as I thought about what to share with you this evening, um, and in lieu of the fact that this is the anniversary of, you know, such a historic event that affected this community uh, as well as our nation, I figured what I would do instead of, you know, trying to trace the, the footsteps of our, you know, my uh, professional forefathers, I thought what I would do is um, do a little bit of the storytelling of the 9-11 experience and try and weave throughout that uh, pieces of history, at least as I know, and in some cases, pieces of history that I actually did participate, uh, participate in, and use that as, um, you know, sort of a way to think about the anniversary 13 years after that event. Um, there have been, obviously, uh, commemorations all day long. For those of you who don't know, because uh, I don't think it got a great deal of press, Yesterday, uh, the United States Congress actually um, provided to the three memorials the congressional gold medals that were authorized in 2011. There was a ceremony at the Capitol where representatives from the families of New York and Wash and uh, uh, Shanksville and Arlington, um, the, the tragedies, tragedies in each of those locations received the gold medals on behalf of those memorials. Um, if you're not familiar with the Congressional Gold Medal, because they're a little bit more, I think, discreet than uh, the presidential medals, uh, but the Congressional Gold Medals are the highest honor, civilian honor, that Congress can bestow. And so uh, the three medals were issued yesterday. I had the good fortune of being on hand for uh, the delivery of those medals because I was asked to serve on the design review committee uh, along with another responder and two family members, uh, which is how each of the sites uh, put forward um, folks. So you can find some news about that. I know somewhere, you know, online, the medal is actually really beautiful. And at some point, uh, the U.S. Mint, who casts those medals, uh, will be making uh, a small facsimile, a small replica available for sale. Um, but the medals themselves actually went uh, with the uh, 
uh, the, the folks that represented the, each of the memorials. Um, if you don't know, while we have the memorial at the Pentagon, on the west side of the Pentagon, on the actual site where the airplane hit, and hopefully many of you have been there to visit it, because I personally believe it is one of the most impactful uh, memorials around. Um, the uh, foundation is actually um, developing plans now to build an education center very close to that memorial. And if those uh, aspirations are realized, then that uh, education center is really going to be focused on obviously keeping the lessons of that tragedy, tragedy alive, but at the same time uh, fostering conversation, dialogue uh, around uh, peaceful endeavors, you know, how do we collaborate better? How do we avoid the kinds of circumstances, um, you know, that may have contributed to, uh, to those attacks? So a laudable goal, and, you know, we certainly in the fire department, our association with the foundation will, I hope, continue because we think that that project, in addition to the memorial as it exists today, is very worthwhile. So uh, let me start by sharing this image with you. Um, some of you may know what this is. Uh, this actually is the July 2nd, 1959 fire at the Pentagon, um, which all the way up until 9-11 was still considered the largest dollar loss building fire in the United States. Um, in 1959 dollars, I'm told it was a $30 million loss. It was a fire in the building uh, that actually was in the area of the Air Force um, computer room and this was computer tape that caught on fire and uh, burned for several hours. Uh, companies from not just Arlington but Alexandria, Fairfax, the District of Columbia, Montgomery and Prince George's counties and I'm told even Baltimore responded uh, to this incident, to this particular fire. And I put it up here because uh, you know obviously it's a uh, a, a well-worn, um, you know, image and uh, probably memory. But whenever I talk about the events of 9-11, one of the things I share with people outside this area is that during my career, I've probably been to, I have been to more multi-alarm fires at the Pentagon than any other area of the county. In fact, three weeks before 9-11, we had a three-alarm fire at the Pentagon. Two weeks after leaving the Pentagon, we had another two alarm fire at the Pentagon. So leaving there on 9-11. Um, so the, the building has had its share of troubles over the years. Um, and Arlington has been there to react and respond to each one of them. In fact, I, I mentioned those fires proximate to the events of 9-11. When I came on the job in 1984, I think within the first year, because I remember um, you know, it used to be that when you came to work in Arlington, you were, wore a khaki uniform. If you were uh, a new member of the organization, you wore a khaki uniform, and only after you had finished your probation did you get your blue uniform. So you sort of stood out, and my own memory of those, you know, early months, early uh, year, because you were expected to get, to get off probation and get out of that khaki uniform within, a, within a, about a 12 to 18 month period. I was in khakis for a three alarm fire at the Pentagon uh, all the way back in 94. It was noteworthy also because I was the only member of my crew that went back to work. Everybody else went to the hospital. Um, so the building has a, a, a lot of significance, you know, obviously in my career and obviously in the, in the eyes of this community given um, its significance for so many reasons. Uh, it is quite often referred to as one of the nation's or one of the world's largest office buildings. I think that, you know, has probably been eclipsed now by a number of buildings. There's probably a half a dozen in Dubai that are bigger than this by now, um, given the investments that they make. Uh, the, what, what we always like to point to is the fact that construction for this building actually started 60 years to the day of the 9-11 tragedy. September 11th, 1941 is when ground was broken uh, for this building. Um, it was obviously a massive undertaking. This building was built in 16 months. 16 months, it was done, ready for occupancy. Um, this is not the location that it was originally supposed to be. Uh, it was originally planned to be just over the, the to our side of the Memorial Bridge. 
Um, but Roosevelt's plan for this building after the war was that it was literally going to be a storage warehouse for file cabinets, which accounts for the strength of the floors. Um, obviously, there were limitations on construction materials because of the war effort, but the, the, the whole point of this building was that it was going to be used during the war. He was going to move both the Navy and the Department of War into the same you know, co-location, but he had every expectation that when the war was over, they would go back to their respective areas, and this place was going to be filled with filing cabinets in perpetuity. All right, so uh, a large building, in fact, we regularly refer to this as five buildings in close proximity to each other because of the five concentric rings. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a, in a few other uh, pictures that we've got. Um, I'll draw your attention to that center courtyard, which is five acres in size. If you've never been in there, it's, a, you know, it's actually the smoking area for the Pentagon now. It's the only place you can smoke you know, in the Pentagon is to go into the, uh, into the center court. These are the images taken from the security cameras on the west side of the Pentagon at 937 in the morning on September 11th. Now, of course, this comes following both of the airplanes in the World Trade Center, but ahead of uh, the Shanksville crash. Um, I will tell you and I'll show you images that will um, hopefully, you know, confirm in your minds that this is in fact a passenger jetliner. There are still people out there who believe that this was something else. Um, in fact, it's not too hard to find on the internet a call for my arrest. Um, some of these theorists uh, have written letters to just about every member of the United States government saying that my FBI colleague who was part of our command and myself are complicit in the deaths of 184 people and that we should be tried uh, for a variety of things I'm, I'm not sure I can even keep up with now. Um, but this is in fact the result of a passenger airliner that takes off from Dulles Airport. So it's a, it's a, it's a local event all the way. The airplane takes off from Dulles Airport and it heads west because its destination is Los Angeles. And about the time that it hits the West Virginia, Ohio line, it turns around. At this point, it has been taken over. It comes back, uh, obviously, towards us, and it makes one pass over the Pentagon. Um, it makes a pass over the building, a large arc, comes back around again, and then comes down to an incredibly low angle, low enough that many uh, automobile drivers and pedestrians on Columbia Pike and Washington Boulevard are marveling at the low altitude of this aircraft as it is coming in for its appointed destination. Uh, it is clipping light poles on Washington Boulevard as it approaches the west side of the Pentagon. And this impact is the result of this 757 um, almost at full throttle, and it never touches the ground before it strikes the building. Okay, I'll show you the, the result of all of that in just a minute. But the force of that um, explosion, um, which penetrates quite a distance into the building, is probably first most felt by the crash fire rescue vehicle from the Fort Myer Fire Department. Many of you know that Fort Myer has its own fire department. They actually run with us on a fairly regular basis. Um, and they are responsible for the helicopter standbys uh, at the Pentagon, in large part because uh, they don't pay me to do it, right? So we, we are the first responders for the Pentagon. We go there every day. But for the helicopter standbys, Fort Myer takes that responsibility. Well, on the morning of September 11th, three firefighters from Fort Myer and their crash fire rescue vehicle are right where this airplane goes in the building. These three firefighters literally run for their lives as they see this airplane approaching. The vehicle is completely destroyed in the ensuing explosion. All three of them are knocked down with somewhat uh, minor injuries and immediately get up and begin the efforts of um, helping the victims as they begin to stream out of the building. This is another view of the building, probably a better one uh, than, the, than the earlier shot. Again, you can see the rings 
which are labeled A through E, beginning on the inside ring, going to the outside ring. This is fairly common knowledge for, for a lot of folks. Um, what may be less known is A and E drive on the top right hand side of the slide right there. A and E drive is actually a covered roadway. And as I've mentioned a couple of times already, um, when we have responded over the years to this building, we have used uh, that, we did use that roadway to our advantage. We would take our apparatus, we would drive it up that roadway and position ourselves in that inner court because in each of the corners of the Pentagon that shapes the center court there are entrance ways into the building that made it pretty easy for us to get where we needed to go, position our apparatus to support our, our interior operations. Over the years, that roadway had been paved a number of times, and that paving essentially reduced the ceiling clearance, making entrance to the center court impossible. That was the situation that we faced on September 11th. But on September 11th, getting into that inner court was absolutely essential. And so firefighters being among the most resourceful people on the planet took to cutting the roofs off the cabs of the apparatus in order to get it where it needed to go. I always revel in the fact that that was actually the number one item on our FEMA reimbursement list. <laughs> in the front of the picture, you see uh, what we refer to as the camp. Um, you see the heliport, uh, and again, where engine 161, the crash fire rescue vehicle was, and of course, the gash in the building. Now, I talked about the speed and the force with which this airplane pushes through the building. And I can tell you that the damage to the building directly from the impact um, goes all the way through to the inner wall of the C ring. So you see the between the B and the C ring, that is actually a roadway. So the size of it, there, there's vehicular traffic that moves, you know, between the B and the C ring. The force of this uh, explosion of this crash goes all the way through and cuts out a hole on the inner wall of the C ring. The first and second floors of the Pentagon um, all the way through are connected. And so this force is taking out, you know, columns uh, and pretty much everything in its way. And it injects 6,000 gallons of jet fuel into the building along with material from the airplane, rivets, hot metal, molten metal essentially. So the combination of the fuel, the molten metal, the concussive forces of the airplane is obviously doing extreme damage to the occupants. Now if there is any good fortune to come out of this potential dimension of the event, it's this. This building normally houses 25,000 people. But as I mentioned, the building at this point is 60 years old and is in considerable disrepair. The technology did not meet standards even of 2001. The telephone system was incredibly antiquated. Um, there were so many obstacles that had been added to the building literally because somebody of a high enough rank decided that he or potentially she didn't like people walking through this particular space. Walls over the years were put up to create new office spaces and to uh, keep people from the free flow uh, through the building as it was originally intended. So shortly before September 11th, 2001, the Pentagon had undertaken the first ever renovation. They were going to modernize this building. And on September 11th, from uh, the wedge here on the corner over to just corridor four there is largely unoccupied. It was just nearing completion of this extensive renovation. Everybody that normally worked there had been relocated to leased space off the site. And on September 11, 2001, they were only then beginning to, 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 to reoccupy that space. 
People were moving new desk furniture in, some files were being brought in. And this accounts for the relatively low, though still tragic, loss of life in this incident. 184 people, 59 on the aircraft and the remainder in the building. The other fortunate part about this incident, such as it is, is that where this airplane strikes, again, as tragic as it is, it is as far away from the Secretary of Defense, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the military, the, the entire leadership of DOD, which is on the other side of the building, all the way on the other side of the building. So not to dismiss the losses on this side of the building, but you know, from a standpoint of DOD leadership, we could have had a secondary tragedy um, associated with this. On that note, I will tell you that stories that you may have heard about then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld rushing to this area are absolutely true. Um, we have, when I got there less than 10 minutes after the airplane had gone into the building, he was still there. Um, he was helping with the injured as so many other people from the building were. Uh, and it was really uh, 15, 20 minutes into this incident when his security detail really grasps what's going on here and whisks him away, you know, gets him out of there um, with the idea that not only is this situation very unstable, but we don't know, I mean, this is effectively the third wave, what's coming next. So this entire area that you see in the front or the, 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 of the picture here where we have the rings and the corridors identify, identified is essentially, um, affected. Now, one of the challenges that I had to deal with very quickly as the incident commander was that you may recall on the afternoon of September 11th, the secretary went out and did his first press conference about this event. And he left that press conference saying that the Pentagon would be open tomorrow, business as usual. My idea was a little bit different. In fact, this incident has caused uh, at, at the time caused such extensive disruption that unless you were very fast in getting out of the building and getting in your personal vehicle and departing, you were prohibited from getting your vehicle and leaving. Your vehicle was evidence on a crime scene and needed to stay exactly where it was. So the combination of that as well as everything that was unfolding in, in the District of Columbia, because what was happening there was just about every federal government uh, employee office um, thought that they were next and you may recall if you were in this area at the time tens of thousands of pedestrians walking out of the District of Columbia okay walking down Interstate 395 and the same happened while many got away on Metro Metro became overwhelmed relatively quickly and and again this building contributed to the flow of people because those that came in cars for the most part were not permitted to take their cars I reference the building because, and we'll get into a little bit about the fire and, and some of the challenges that we were dealing with here, but I reference it in part because um, later in the event, uh, long about September 13th, we actually had or authorized to have built partition walls on the corridors uh, three and six so that essentially the secretary's desires of getting the building back, those unaffected parts of the building back into operation um, could happen. We essentially walled off the area that we were continuing to work in, uh, you know, trying to accommodate the needs, again, for a very large building. These are the scenes on scene. The car in the top right-hand photo right there actually belongs to the air traffic controller um, in that small uh, building that you saw approximate to the heliport, the guy who's guiding the... Uh, I actually met him a year ago, first time I'd, I'd ever run into him. He actually had changed jobs and he was in another presentation that I was doing and he introduced himself. That's his car destroyed there. The cab you see out on Washington Boulevard, out on 27, you know, has been struck by debris. Uh, and of course the, you know, the building is uh, being ravaged by the, by the fire and again the, the explosion itself. We, when we're doing this from a different perspective, we always try and emphasize, and I thought it would be instructive for this group tonight, to understand a little bit about how we are looking at an incident scene like this. Because what we're really trying to do is deal with a lot of competing priorities. Obviously, the first priority is all designed around life safety. It, it is all rescue, medical care for those that are injured. But to do that, 
you know, we've got a lot of other work to do, like getting a system of organization together, um, which we call incident command. Um, it is about, in an incident like this, recognizing that shortly into the incident, you better be having some pretty robust scene security because, again, what other threats are coming your way? Given what we've witnessed in New York, um, this became a very high priority. And then, as the incident wears on, there are other threats, other risks associated with this incident, like the hazardous materials uh, that, that are brought along. I will tell you that we uh, did an evaluation for chemical agents that might have been part of this attack. There were classified resources from the federal government that helped us to um, eliminate a worry about biological, and, and radiological was another hazard that we had to uh, evaluate and eliminate. And of course, uh, the collapse, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and, and responder safety. I say command, uh, incident command, very intentionally because it is the system of management that we use um, when, when we go to any incident. If we go to a, a typical incident today, a routine incident, you know, as small as a medical emergency, well, we will use the concepts of incident command. It is how we use uh, our chain of command. It's how we use our standard operating procedures. It's how we use our communication procedures. It really is a standardized framework. Um, in my world, um, the unified command effort, which brings together multiple agencies to work together, to work collaboratively, um, is sometimes referred to as, a, as the unicorn of emergency response. People talk about it a lot, but they've never seen it. Okay? In point of fact, it happened here. It's been well documented by the 9-11 Commission and other after-action reports that this probably still stands today as the best example of unified command that's ever occurred in uh, emergency response throughout the country. Um, and command is something that is initiated with the arrival of the first responder. So on the morning of September 11th, the first unit to arrive, two minutes after the airplane struck the building, was Truck 105 from the Crystal City Fire Station. The, that particular morning, the person in charge of that unit was actually a firefighter, not a fire officer. He was not an appointed supervisor. For that day, he was in an acting officer position. He was working up a level. And yet, when that unit arrived on the incident scene, that firefighter, firefighter Derek Spector, had the authority of the fire chief. He could call for any unit, he could call for as many of them as he needed, and he could direct every one of them that was coming in to the response to do what he thought they needed to do in those moments. Now, because of the gravity and the size of this incident, he didn't retain that command position for very long. And in fact, he was relieved of that position by Battalion Chief Bob Cornwell, uh, at that time, a 35-year veteran of the department and somebody who had done a lot of his time in the Crystal City area, and a man who had returned to work on September 11th as his first day back to work after being off for almost four months of cancer treatment. In fact, he was still undergoing cancer treatments on the morning of, or on the, on, at the time of the September 11th attack. Um, Chief Cornwell did not retain command too long either because, as I say, I arrived very quickly and assumed command, and my first um, substantial direction was for Chief Cornwell to lead our first crews into the building to begin the search and res rescue effort. Let me take a moment to observe, however, that for all of the work that this department and our partner agencies from around the, the area uh, did that day, the real heroes of that morning were the occupants of the building. The real heroes were the military and civilian workers at the Pentagon who did more to effect rescues, more to get their colleagues out of the building. Many who were obviously distraught and or lost by the smoke, by the fire, by the heat, and by new features in the building, like 600 pound fire doors that were newly added as a part of the renovation, that activated and slid across hallways that really were the only way in and out that many people knew. And so when they ran into that door thinking this was the way I'm going to get out, it was a revelation and it was only because other people in the building, you know, who kept their wits about them and could provide assistance did those doors get moved enough for people to actually get, get past them. The real heroes 
the military and civilian occupants of the building that morning. Our emergency operations center um, is what goes into uh, action when we have a crisis, a large-scale crisis in the county. The Emergency Operations Center has a lot of responsibilities. One of them is to support the incident response. Incident command calls all the shots on the incident scene, but to the extent that we need more resources, um, that somebody needs to pay attention to the rest of the county to make sure that, you know, the next 911 call for a heart attack or a smell of smoke in somebody's home is answered, that's the job of the EOC. The guy in the right-hand side of the right-hand picture happens to be Captain Mark Penn. Mark, on September 11th, was a 25-year veteran of the department. This is his second day as the emergency manager. Second day as the emergency manager. The county manager, who is by law the emergency services director of the county, walks into the emergency operations center, his appointed destination during a crisis like this, and looks at Mark and says, who are you? because they have yet to work together. They have yet to exercise together. They have yet to establish any kind of a bond or rapport. Nonetheless, Mark knew exactly what he was doing. If that is, um, if Mark's uh, being there for two days catches your attention, let me share with you the other side of that equation, which was the man who was our emergency manager for several years leading up to this incident, in fact, he spent about 15 years with us on the department, left the department the Friday before September 11th. So the biggest dance of all of our lives, and he missed it because he went to work for the Department of Justice and his last day of work was the Friday before. Uh, Kevin Fan, and he was a great guy, we, is a great guy, we still ha maintain regular contact. I will tell you too, just you know, as citizens, one of the things that you should understand is that in our system, uh, of government. Disasters like this, you will hear very often language about, you know, when you, when you hear about hurricane damage or tornado damage, you will hear about disaster declarations. Those disaster declarations come about because a locality is saying in a crisis, we are tapped out. We don't have any more resources. We need assistance. And they, what the locality then does is turn to the state and say to the state, we need assistance. On September 11th, and even today for the most part, states don't have a lot of resources that we need for these kinds of responses. So the states immediately turn to the federal government. The locality can't go right to the federal government. Our conduit is through the state. And what the state is saying to the federal government under the Stafford uh, Disaster Act is, we're out of resources and we need federal assistance. Most of the federal assistance comes in the form of money. The disaster, the disaster declaration is a presidentially authorized declaration that says the money can flow to support the response. But there are also other kinds of assets which we'll describe here in just a few minutes. But that whole, that, that operation goes through the, the Emergency Operations Center. I should tell you that that's also where the, the local disaster declaration is made. The manager signs off on that and it then has to be ratified by the elected body, in our case, the county board. Again, just a little bit more in terms of the pictures, and I promised you some evidence of an airplane. That is part of the skin from American Airlines Flight uh, 77. Um, many more around, and I'll show you another image later on of where some of that was collected. One of the great fortunes that we had and continue to have today is our system of partnership with our adjacent jurisdictions. So Northern Virginia today responds under a system of automatic aid. Automatic aid means that we dispatch the closest units to an incident, to a request for service, regardless of the jurisdiction. So you all would be familiar with the West End of Columbia Pike, and I can use as an example the fact that the closest units to much of the West End of Columbia Pike is actually Bailey's Crossroad in Fairfax County. Those units respond into the county and serve our citizens at the same level of expertise that my people do, four, five, sometimes six, seven times a day. They are part of a larger system than we operate just in the county, which not only extends our resources, but creates enormous coordination that is already pre-scripted when you have an incident like this. That particular arrangement came about back in 1975. The rest of the country was being encouraged to do this after 9-11 in an example set by Northern Virginia. Northern Virginia set that example back in 1975, and they set it after another particularly disastrous incident 
and that was the collapse of the Skyline Towers apartment building in Bailey's Crossroads. If you go up George Mason Drive all the way to Route 7 and you look across at those big high rises there, well, one of those collapsed under construction. Fortunately, there were not a lot of people, a lot, a lot, there were not a lot of construction workers still there. I don't know exactly what the loss of life was, but it was relatively minimal. But that particular area of Northern Virginia is, you know, one of many sort of intersections of the jurisdictions, right? There's a, there's a point right there where Alexander, Arlington, and Fairfax all come together. And in the wake of that incident, the chiefs at the time said, you know, we can serve our communities better if we forget about the jurisdictional boundaries, if we just send the closest units. And that will have the added benefit of providing more safety to our, to our members, right? Our firefighters will be safer because we'll get faster backup. We will, get, we, will, we will control incidents faster with that kind of an arrangement. And so that arrangement, that collaborative um, partnership started in 1975 and evolved to the point where, again, in September of 2001, in the wake of 9-11, uh, the entire country is talking about communications interoperability. Why can't fire and police talk? Why can't fire departments from different jurisdictions talk, right, on their radios? Well, here, we had that solved back in the late 70s. We didn't have it completely solved with D.C. or suburban Maryland, but we had it largely solved in Northern Virginia. And we set the, the, the actual path where the rest of the national capital region, the Washington metropolitan area, could achieve that shortly after September 11th. So these are all the jurisdictions that sent resources in assistance. Automatic aid from Alexandria, Fairfax, Fairfax City, Loudoun, and Prince William, and mutual aid from Montgomery, Prince George's, and the District of Columbia. What's the difference between automatic and mutual? Mutual aid is you're actually calling the jurisdiction and asking for assistance. In automatic aid, we're actually dispatching somebody else's resources. But in mutual aid, we call up the other jurisdiction, we tell them what our problem is, and we ask for their assistance. Again, going back in history, that mutual aid agreement for the larger metropolitan area is the product of another event that didn't long predate 9-11. It was the Air Florida crash in 1982. In January of 1982, an airliner uh, tries to take off in a snowstorm from National Airport. It fails to clear the 14th Street Bridge and crashes in the river. And at the time, the metropolitan area has no operating plan for jurisdictions to work together. Not, not across the river, certainly. And so we don't have communications interoperability. In fact, we don't even know how we're going to work together. And the Culmination of the event in the Potomac River is the District of Columbia Fire Department telling the Arlington County Fire Department on the other side of the river, we don't want you here, go home. The area was rightly excoriated for that lack of ability to work together. And beginning in the early 80s, at, in the wake of that event, there was a mutual aid operations plan that was developed for the entire metropolitan area. Um, that plan is something that we operated by all the way through 9-11 and then enhanced largely because um, for all of its benefits, it was not a legally binding agreement and we actually needed congressional action that didn't come until 2005 that enabled the National Capital Region to enter into a legally binding uh, mutual aid agreement. It's actually part of the Intelligence Reform Act. Okay, it was a part of the Intelligence Reform Act legislation that enabled us to, to, to do that. And as I already mentioned, we had state and federal response, little from the, from the state, but a good deal from the federal. And one of the reasons that the FBI's uh, symbol is up here is because they were probably our most important and effective partner. But in another example of our ability to look forward, we began that relationship with the FBI in 1998. So you may know that by presidential directive, harking back to the mid-90s, any act of terrorism in the United States, the lead law enforcement agency is the FBI. Local law enforcement does not have the lead for an act of terrorism. They are a partner, they participate, just like I will show you here shortly, uh, they did in Arlington. But the FBI is the lead law enforcement agency. In 1998, as the result of events that they had studied, it became clear to the Washington field office of the FBI that their traditional partners in response to large crisis 
was not going to be local law, enforcement, local law enforcement. They were certainly going to be there. They were going to be a part of the response. But the main partner they were going to need to get close to was the fire and EMS service. And so that field office in 1998 reached out to the, the fire chiefs in the national capital region and not only began to establish a relationship with us, but they attended regional meetings, they attended exercises. In fact, we had a massive Northern Virginia exercise attended by the FBI on September 8th, 2001. A chemical exercise in Fairfax County, the FBI participated as did most of the fire departments from the region. And so when we went to work on the morning of September 11th, the trusted relationships already existed. There was no jockeying for position, right? There was a very good understanding about how things were going to work, how things, who was going to be in charge, and how we would, we would do things. Our effectiveness that morning also came about because we weren't sitting back here in Arlington waiting for this event to make terrorism real. In 1995, you all will remember the Murrah Building bombing in Oklahoma City. What you may remember less is another event that happened in 1995, and that was the sarin attack in the Tokyo subway. The Am Shinriko cult made up a batch of sarin, which is a chemical nerve agent, it's a chemical warfare agent. They made up a batch of that, they put it in the subway in Tokyo in plastic bags, punctured those bags as they got off the train, and up to 5,000 people were affected. Only 12 died, only, not insignificant, given, but, but given what sarin is capable of, it could have been far worse. And with that event, we here in Arlington said, that could happen here. We have a subway system. We in the Washington metropolitan area are probably, at some point in the future, a likely target for terrorists. We worked with our metropolitan area colleagues and we wrote a letter to the President of the United States. We, we wrote a letter to Bill Clinton and that letter said, you, what, you witnessed what happened in Tokyo. If that were to occur here in our subway, a subway by the way, on which the federal government depends mightily, we are not trained, we do not have the knowledge, we do not have the equipment to deal with that kind of an incident. The President tasked the Department of Health and Human Services, ultimately the U.S. Public Health Service, to work with us on just such a capability. And in January of 1996, we went live with the nation's first non-military counterterrorism team. A team made up of fire, EMS, and law enforcement professionals, nurses and doctors, and equipment and capabilities nobody else had. We had detection capabilities for chemical warfare agents that nobody else other than the military had. We had protective clothing and equipment that enabled us to work in contaminated environments for extended periods of time, beyond what we do in a fire. We had a cache of chemical antidote, Mark I kits that carried on the battlefields that were in our possession, that traveled with us wherever we went, and we had another cache that we could deploy anywhere we wanted should an incident like this occur. Beginning in January of 1996, we were deployed, forward deployed, for presidential inaugurations. In fact, in the last three presidential inaugurations, members of that team were positioned underneath the inaugural platform on the steps of the Capitol. Their role was to get people off the platform should it be attacked during the inauguration. In every State of the Union address beginning in 1996 until two years ago when the team went dark, the team was pre-positioned underneath the House chamber. And their role was to rescue the legislative leadership of the United States Congress. That capability, this concept, then was replicated in 124 cities across the United States. And the semblance of that, called the Metropolitan Medical Response System, still exists today in many of those communities. I use the slide here of the National Medical Response Team because that was the response element that we created. And it was the team deployed on 9-11 that did our hazmat assessment that I described before, the chemical and radiological um, assessments. So back in 1995, we're already focused on this issue. We realized that as a metropolitan area and the seat of the federal United States government, we could be a target. How do we begin to plan and prepare for 
those kinds of events. The military assistance, obviously it is the Pentagon, but interestingly the Pentagon as a reservation is not part of any other military command. It is a separate and independent reservation. And quite frankly, the leadership in DOD didn't have much interaction or much uh, experience working with locals. And so they assigned Major General James Jackson, then the two-star in charge of the military district of Washington, to be our liaison. And at six o'clock on the evening of September 11th, um, when I called a meeting of all of the representatives of the response agencies that were there, uh, that meeting was held in Secretary Rumsfeld's press briefing room in the Pentagon, because it was on the other side and we could do so safely. Uh, General Jackson presented himself to me, introduced himself, said that he had been appointed by the secretary to be our liaison, and if there was anything that DOD could provide in support, um, he would make that available. He then appointed two colonels to sit in the unified command post with us 24 hours a day, and that became our access to military resources. The law doesn't allow a civilian to direct military resources, but we could collaborate with the colonels and through the general's authority, get the military to do what we needed to do in the moment. The building collapse was obviously a big feature of this particular event. It happens very early in the, in the incident and just added another dimension to the response. And we'll pick up on that here in just a moment. Another picture, you see this is uh, a little bit beyond, but the fire, this is, this is where uh, early pictures that you'll see the crash fire rescue vehicles from the airport doing their work, it is at this point that they become completely um, useless. They, their streams cannot get in underneath this collapsed area. Um, and again, a significant added dimension. What happens next to us of significance is that in our unified command area, I have my FBI colleague, at the time, Special Agent Christopher Combs, who was one of those liaisons from the Washington field office that I described before. Chris turns to me in the command post and he says, there's another airplane headed our way. The FBI's national headquarters, what is called the Strategic Information and Operations Center, which goes live during any national crisis, has activated for 9-11, as you would expect. Uh, some of the representatives in the FBI's SIOC include the FAA. We are told at one point that there are still eight aircraft that are unaccounted for. Now remember, there's an order that goes out shortly after the this situation begins to shape up that says all aircraft goes to ground. All aircraft are ordered to go to ground. By the way, we don't have enough parking spaces for all the airplanes, right? Some of them have to go to Canada. Some that are coming from overseas have to turn around because there is not enough places to put all these airplanes. There's not enough landing spaces to get all of these down. But we are told there are eight aircraft that are still unaccounted for. And Chris turns to me because he is getting direct information from the field office who is getting information from the SIOC. And he says, there's another airplane headed our way and he has been told it's 20 minutes out. Now, it's hard for me to say what I might have done with that information had I not witnessed the second airplane into the World Trade Center. I turn on the, air, the television like many of you and see that the first tower, the North Tower, has been struck and is burning. I have a sense already that it's terrorism because the silhouette of the airplane for me is just a little too crisp didn't look to me like there, was an that, like there was an attempt to avoid hitting the building, as you might have thought. And those fears are confirmed when the second airplane goes into the building, as we all witness on the television. And with that knowledge, it's now clear to me that airplanes are being used as weapons and there are secondary waves of attack. So when I am told that there is an airplane 20 minutes out, though I pause for a minute, I ultimately make the decision to evacuate the incident scene, feeling that if we stay exposed to another airplane that comes into the Pentagon, we're going to lose our response anyway. What good am I going to do for people that may still be salvageable? And so we evacuate the incident scene, and the majority of people running at quick speed with the victims uh, that, are, that have littered the lawn and make for, for the most part, underneath the, over, the 395 overpasses and on the other side of Route 27, um, in the area of Columbia Pike. And then we get a countdown. The airplane's 15 minutes out, it's 10 minutes out, it's four minutes out. 
What's happened here is that the FAA knows that this airplane uh, has turned off its transponder and it's off radar. So they are assuming this airplane has gone to a low trajectory like Flight 77 does and they have mapped out how long it's going to take to come to the Pentagon. This in fact was Flight 93 that crashed in Shanksville. And its transponder did go off, but when they lost it from radar, it was because the passengers had already taken it into the ground. The report comes back to us that it's crashed into Camp David, the president's weekend retreat, which, as the crow flies, is not that far away. At the same time, we are told that a car bomb has gone off at the State Department and that an airplane has gone into the White House. This is the fog of war. We now know that, with pretty good certainty, that that airplane, Flight 93, was headed to the Capitol. That, it would, that its target, its destination, was the Capitol. Um, which would have been really difficult to manage on top of what we were already dealing with. Several hours later, there was a second evacuation. Because, for reasons that go beyond our discussion tonight, Chris has been pulled out of the command post and is unavailable, and I don't have that same chain of information coming from the SIOC or the field office. But the tower at National Airport radios to our communication center, calls our communication center and says, there's another airplane out there, and it's headed our way. Now, we've been told everything's grounded, and nobody's told us that anything else is authorized. We do another version of the evacuation. And we shortly afterwards find out that this was the airplane bringing the Attorney General of the United States back into Washington, D.C. Somebody knew that, but in a demonstration of that breakdown of communications, we lost that information. So I already showed with you, shared with you the collapse. I want to share with you just a little bit about the collapse rescue effort because this is different than firefighting. It's different than medical care for casualties. The collapse was initially dealt with with the three technical rescue teams of Arlington, Alexandria, and the Military District of Washington, which has an interesting mission itself. There is a team of Army engineers, they're technically bulldozer operators, heavy equipment operators, that have been trained to do technical rescue for the largely singular mission of a collapse at the White House. But they arrive on the incident scene at the Pentagon on the morning of September 11th, and we incorporate them into our response and incident command. But we know we're going to need more, and so we begin to ask for urban search and rescue teams. Urban search and rescue teams, we call them USARs, are local teams that are funded by the federal government and tasked during emergencies, deployed to areas uh, where they are needed. Their primary skill set is in collapse rescue. Fairfax County happens to have one of the premier teams. They deploy overseas, have for decades, you know, for missions overseas. And of course, they're a mutual aid or automatic aid partner. So we call them in Montgomery County, who also has a USAR team, under our mutual aid agreements. They are authorized by FEMA, and we have them there by the end of, September, by the, end of the day on September 11th. The other teams from Virginia Beach, Memphis, Tennessee, and New Mexico come in the subsequent days and uh, become a part of our response. So this is the inside of the building as worked by these technical rescue teams. I have to tell you, uh, of note, we have, um, I told you the Pentagon is undergoing renovation and it's being done by what amounts to an organization that is running the contractors, but the deputy director of that organization um, is a woman who happens to have, or happened at the time, well she still does I guess, has a PhD in blast physics. She has been located um, about two miles away from the incident scene, but has a visual through a video feed. And she is looking at the condition of the building and grows very concerned about the safety of the responders. Her FBI handler calls me in the command post and, and expresses that concern, and I say, bring her down here. They bring her down, we put a hard hat on her, she walks into the building and she sees this. And she comes out after about an hour's worth of evaluation she comes back to the command post, and she tells me that the building has been made safer, the building has been made stronger by virtue of the work of these USAR and technical rescue teams than before the airplane hit it. A testament to their work. Or perhaps an indictment of the condition of the Pentagon. 
Uh, we give you this because uh, in the right-hand corner here, uh, it, it, the, the USAR teams actually bring their own structural engineers. They're not just firefighters. There's a lot of firefighters, a lot of rescue technicians that, that, that work for us. Um, but they bring specialties that our technical rescue team like mine, as good as they are, does not have. And again, this slide just gives you a, a sense of the scope of work, you know, the, the enormity of it, um, again, as large as the building is. Specialized equipment was, you know, really essential. We came to call this particular piece of equipment T-Rex uh, um, because of its ability to reach up and grab pieces of what we call widow makers, the overhangs of concrete and structural collapse that can actually kill responders. Um, at the time, there were only three of these in the country. One of them was in Baltimore, and we were able to get it transported to the Pentagon by the evening of September 11th. And this probably cut a good 10 days off of our, of our operation. Night operations were a particularly difficult period. Um, this is a picture taken on September 11th, night falls. We've got the majority of the fire out in the building. Uh, we have cared for and transported all of the casualties that have um, that we've either removed from the building or got out on their own. Uh, and we are taking a bit of a pause here because we have yet to assess the to uh, effectively assess the structural integrity of the building. And so moving through it at nighttime, you know, proved a little bit more perilous than I was willing to uh, put our people in. So we, we backed off a little, but in doing so, the, even though the majority of the fire had been out, the fire continued to burn underneath these peaked roof structures that you see over the corridors and the A and E rings. Now you'll notice the rest of the roof is all a concrete deck. And actually that's what is under those peaked roofs also. Okay, But they have built these roofs, we refer to them as rain roofs, they built these roofs on top of that concrete deck with heavy timber and unbeknownst to me, until halfway through the night, it is clear that there is a fire burning underneath these roofs. 60 year old horsehair insulation. So the fire has gotten in that insulation and it is running those roofs. And so late on the night of, now we're into September 12th, we put people back on the roof and quite frankly, the only way to get at that kind of fire is heavy manual labor. It is breaking up the slate deck that you see there, that's all slate, breaking up that slate deck and getting hose streams underneath uh, that to, to get that fire out. The Joint Operations Center we just referred to because it was located at Fort Myer and this is really where the federal government organizes all of its support to the incident, but it also includes locals. We had people that were assigned to the Joint Operations Center um, and it does a lot of things that even an incident commander doesn't have the license to do. And the example I always like to use, because I think it's very instructive and it, and it showed government working well in an instance like this. Um, the medical examiner for the Commonwealth of Virginia came to the Joint Operations Center on the morning of September 12th. If you read any of the Patricia Cornwell novels, you'll recognize her in those, she's the, she is the uh, model for the, for the female medical examiner, I'm told, uh, in Patricia Cornwell's. And, and I, I can tell you, when this woman showed up on the morning of September 12th, I, could, I, I was ready to salute her. She was, you know, she knew what she wanted, she knew what she was there for, and what she was there for was to say, under the law, it's my responsibility to take possession of these victims' remains and process them in accordance with Virginia law. If the federal government wants to take responsibility for that, the Attorney General of the United States needs to transmit a letter to the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Virginia within the next couple of hours saying you're going to take that responsibility. If you do, I'm going back to Richmond. If you don't, I'm going to work. That message passed up the FBI to the Attorney General who during a crisis like this is in the SIOC. He actually has his own quarters in the SIOC. Instantaneously, for all intents and purposes, that agreement was made. The letter was drafted, went to the, went to the Commonwealth of Virginia, and the federal government took responsibility for uh, the victim remains. Something we cannot do, something uh, you know, a local fire chief or, or even an assistant chief um, is not going to be in a position to do. Media, managing the media always becomes a big deal uh, for an incident like this, and we certainly had our uh, challenges here. Um, obviously, the building has its own media on a frequent basis, but they were all escorted off the reservation uh, as the emergency was unfolding. 
And you may recall, it's been gone now for about a year, the Sitco station on South Joyce Street. I will tell you now that any television picture you saw during these days of the west side of the Pentagon came from that vantage point. Came from that, everybody was there. All the national and international uh, news agencies were there. Um, and we were very fortunate during this time to have as our public affairs director for the county a just retired army colonel who did the same job in the Pentagon before he came to work for us. And so we did a briefing for the press every four hours to update them on what was going on. Um, and I think we're pretty effective in our messaging. I just share with you because it's a dimension of the response that I think is always interesting, certainly is for me, um, the collection of evidence. Because people oftentimes get the impression that the, and, and, and their reputation sometimes suggests that the, the FBI is going to be singularly focused on evidence collection and prosecuting a case. But the fact is, again, because of that relationship that we had with the, with the, with the FBI, that all took a back seat to the mission of life safety, fire control, collapse, rescue, those sorts of things. Um, but nonetheless, you know, evidence collection has to go on. And so you still, you see hose streams here, you see ladders in the background, but there is the collection of evidence, uh, which in this case became important because it all contributed to the prosecution of Masawi, right? The 20th, the suspected 20th hijacker who was eventually convicted. Evidence from here, uh, you know, was all used in the Masawi trial. Um, moreover, so this is what the inside of the building looks like um, as a result of this incident. When we are done stage one of evidence collection, it looks like this. And yes, we, the floors are substantial enough to carry bobcats. Um, all, you know, literally everything off the floor uh, and out of the building. Um, just as a component of evidence collection, this is the hole that I talked about between the C and the B rings. And it is there that the black box was found, along with the nose gear from the aircraft. By the way, note the black box is orange. The black box is not black. In this case, the, the black box is not good at withstanding fire or fuel. Both here in abundance. No information was gotten off the black box. The evidence collection operation continues. Uh, I talked about the things that come out of the building. What's happening is they come out of the building. They are trucked around to the north parking lot at the Pentagon. And what is happening here is that you see in the very top of the picture, just the sliver there, is a pile of debris. This is the, everything that's been in the building. And it has been put in a big pile there. And then systematically, it is brought into piles that you see the two pieces of heavy equipment there. They are taking, a, taking debris and putting it in a pile and spreading it out. In the pile be below that, those are the evidence technicians. They are going over that pile um, to literally pick up any piece of evidence that they can. They are also, the FBI who has to lead this operation is also responsible for the recovery of all personal effects. All personal effects, the, the victim's families were given access to every personal effect brought out of the building. The, the, the FBI still has a, a good deal of it, I understand, um, so that all of it can be rightfully returned if it can be properly identified. Um, they've gotten a lot more popular in the last 13 years, but I can tell you tens of thousands of challenge coins. Tens of thousands of challenge coins, which all had to be saved. This is a painstaking process, but what is extremely valuable out of this process is that it is this that enabled us to determine, or enabled the FBI to determine, how the planes were hijacked. The weapons, how the planes were hijacked, how the planes were taken. The weapons, the methods were all discovered here, as were the driver's licenses of the terrorists. So. You can shortchange this, but you lose, obviously, evidence and you lose valuable intelligence that can go to protect us going forward. This just gives you another view, and the lines actually are security perimeters. I, I told you I would share that green circle in the middle down there actually is where airplane parts were housed. That's where all the airplane parts were collected. FAA still does play a role in these kinds of things, even though it is an act of terrorism. 
Um, and so we, we do our best to collect everything uh, both inside the building and out. Um, obviously, the majority of the airplane has been destroyed in the fire and the, uh, and the explosion, but there's enough of it there to, um, to provide valuable information. So we talked a little bit about command. Um, on September 21st, this is 10 days into the incident, the fire department, who has been the lead in command for 10 days, transfers command um, to the FBI. Now, transfer in this context means that we were the primary decision makers, although we're not directing the FBI. Our collaborative relationship and our common understanding of what we're after here is so good based on those three years of, of uh, relationship building leading up to this um, that really what we've done is exchange seats. We go to a secondary role and they take primary. And for all intents and purposes at this point, because all of the victim remains have been removed, the building has been stabilized, uh, evidence is still being processed, but now the main focus is, is on the crime scene. And obviously that's the FBI's role. So we do a transfer of command. We actually did it in a ceremony because we had many hundreds of responders from outside the area. The nation had not been through this kind of thing before, and we wanted to establish in a very forthright and apparent way to everybody that command was changing. General Jackson actually led this command change ceremony. Uh, he wanted to acknowledge the USAR teams and their good work as they were going back home. And it was just a way, you know, as a symbol for us uh, to, to, to sort of mark uh, the transition. This is uh, my last image, and it's one that has probably become somewhat iconic. Um, the unfurling of this flag over the side of the building was actually used by the CBS Evening U News for six or seven years after 9-11. Um, it is a, uh, it, the, the, what, 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 what occurred here was that General Jackson came to me, the president was about to visit, he wanted a symbol of national unity as the president came, he said, if I bring you a flag, can you get it up on the side of the building? I said, roger that, not a problem, we'll take care of it. Short time later, young soldier presents himself at the command post with the flag, I radio to the people on the roof that you see in that picture right there, I tell them what's happening, uh, the soldier takes the flag up to him. They prepare to unfurl the flag and quickly recognize the field of stars is on the wrong side. Stop it. This is a very heavy flag. Stop it. Turn it over. Get it right. And let it go over the side. An iconic moment. I think one that, you know, as I still remember watching, you know, was one of those just spine tingling kinds of moments, there are no Arlington firefighters associated with the dropping of the flag. They are from Alexandria and Fairfax. I did not script who was there and I didn't manipulate people to photographic advantage. The next day, the White House called and wanted to know who those firefighters were. And being the good protector of my people I was and still am, I said, we don't know. <laughs> but the White House, being as resourceful as they are, found out. And each of those firefighters from Alexandria and Fairfax got a presidentially signed photo of that picture. So an unfortunate outcome, but one that nonetheless, I think, is emblematic of the teamwork, the collaboration, our ability to get things done in the face of a national crisis um, that I still today remain immensely proud of. And with that, I would love to hear or take your questions.